Chapter Two, Part One of A Group of Noble Dames by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. Dame the Second, Barbara of the House of Grebe by the Old Surgeon, Part One. It was apparently an idea rather than a passion that inspired Lord Upland Towers to resolve to win her. Nobody ever knew when he formed it or whence he got his assurance of success in the face of her manifest dislike of him, possibly not until after that first important act of her life which I shall presently mention. His matured and cynical doggedness at the age of nineteen, when impulse mostly rules calculation, was remarkable, and might have owed its existence as much to his succession to the earldom and its accompanying local honours in childhood as to the family character. An elevation which jerked him into maturity, so to speak, without his having known adolescence. He had only reached his twelfth year when his father, the fourth earl, died after a course of the bath waters. Nevertheless, the family character had a great deal to do with it. Determination was hereditary in the bearers of that escutcheon, sometimes for good, sometimes for evil. The seats of the two families were about ten miles apart the way between them lying along the now old, then new, turnpike road connecting Havenpool and Warburn with the city of Melchester, a road which, though only a branch from what is known as the Great Western Highway, is probably, even at present, as it has been for the last hundred years, one of the finest examples of macadamized turnpike track that can be found in England. The mansion of the Earl, as well as that of his neighbour, Barbara's father, stood back about a mile from the highway, with which each was connected by an ordinary drive and lodge. It was along this particular highway that the young earl drove on a certain evening at Christmas tide, some twenty years before the end of the last century, to attend a ball at Cheen Manor, the home of Barbara, and her parents, Sir John and Lady Grebe. Sir John's baronetcy was created a few years before the breaking out of the Civil War, and his lands were even more extensive than those of Lord Upland Towers himself, comprising this manor of Cheen, another on the coast near, half the hundred of Cockdean, and well-enclosed lands in several other parishes, notably Warburn and those contiguous. At this time Barbara was barely seventeen, and the ball is the first occasion on which we have any tradition of Lord Upland Towers attempting tender relations with her. It was early enough, God knows." An intimate friend, one of the Drenkards, is said to have dined with him that day, and Lord Upland Towers had, for a wonder, communicated to his guest the secret design of his heart. "'You'll never get her. Sure you'll never get her,' this friend said at parting. "'She's not drawn to your lordship by love, and as for thought of a good match, why there's no more calculation in her than in a bird.' "'We'll see,' said Lord Upland Towers, impassively. He no doubt thought of his friend's forecast as he travelled along the highway in his chariot, but the sculptural repose of his profile against the vanishing daylight on his right hand would have shown his friend that the earl's equanimity was undisturbed. He reached the solitary wayside tavern called the Lompton Inn, the rendezvous of many a daring poacher for operations in the adjoining forest, and he might have observed, if he had taken the trouble, a strange post-chaise standing in the halting space before the inn. He duly sped past it, and half an hour after through the little town of Warburn, onward, a mile farther, was the house of his entertainer. At this date it was an imposing edifice, or rather congeries of edifices, as extensive as the residence of the earl himself, though far less regular. One wing showed extreme antiquity, having huge chimneys whose substructures projected from the external walls like towers, and a kitchen of vast dimensions, in which, it was said, breakfast had been cooked for John of Gaunt. Whilst he was yet in the forecourt, he could hear the rhythm of the French horns and clarinets, the favourite instruments of those days at such entertainments. Entering the long parlour, in which the dance had just been opened by Lady Grebe with a minuet, it being now seven o'clock, according to the tradition, he was received with a welcome befitting his rank, and looked round for Barbara. She was not dancing, and seemed to be preoccupied, almost indeed as though she had been waiting for him. 
Barbara at this time was a good and pretty girl, who never spoke ill of any one, and hated other pretty women the very least possible. She did not refuse him for the country dance which followed, and soon after was his partner in a second. The evening wore on, and the horns and clarinets tooted merrily. Barbara evinced toward her lover neither distinct preference nor aversion, but old eyes would have seen that she pondered something. However, after supper she pleaded a headache and disappeared. To pass the time of her absence, Lord Upland Towers went into a little room adjoining the long gallery, where some elderly ones were sitting by the fire, for he had a phlegmatic dislike of dancing for its own sake, and lifting the window curtains, he looked out of the window into the park and wood, dark now as a cavern. Some of the guests appeared to be leaving even so soon as this, two lights showing themselves as turning away from the door and sinking into nothing in the distance. His hostess put her head into the room to look for partners for the ladies, and Lord Upland Towers came out. Lady Grebe informed him that Barbara had not returned to the ballroom. She had gone to bed in sheer necessity. "'She has been so excited over the ball all day,' her mother continued, "'that I feared she would be worn out early. "'But sure, Lord Upland Towers, you won't be leaving yet.' "'He said that it was near twelve o'clock, and that some had already left. "'I protest nobody has gone yet,' said Lady Grebe. "'To humour her, he stayed till midnight, and then set out. "'He had made no progress in his suit, "'but he had assured himself that Barbara gave no other guest the preference, "'and nearly everybody in the neighbourhood was there. "'Tis only a matter of time,' said the calm young philosopher. The next day he lay till near ten o'clock, and he had only just come out upon the head of the staircase when he heard hooves upon the gravel without. In a few moments the door had been opened, and Sir John Grebe met him in the hall as he set foot on the lowest stair. "'My lord, where's Barbara, my daughter?' Even the Earl of Upland Towers could not repress amazement. "'What's the matter, my dear Sir John?' says he. The news was startling indeed. From the baronet's disjointed explanation, Lord Upland Towers gathered that after his own and the other guest's departure, Sir John and Lady Grebe had gone to rest without seeing any more of Barbara. It being understood by them that she had retired to bed when she sent word to say that she could not join the dancers again. Before then she had told her maid that she would dispense with her services for this night, and there was evidence to show that the young lady had never laid down at all, the bed remaining unpressed. Circumstances seemed to prove that this deceitful girl had feigned indisposition to get an excuse for leaving the ballroom, and that she had left the house within ten minutes, presumably during the first dance after supper. "'I saw her go,' said Lord Upland Towers. "'The devil you did!' says Sir John. "'Yes!' and he mentioned the retreating carriage lights, and how he was assured by Lady Grebe that no guest had departed. "'Surely that was it,' said the father. "'But she's not gone alone, do you know?' "'Ah, who is the young man?' "'I can only guess. My worst fear is my most likely guess. I'll say no more. I thought, yet I would not believe, it possible that you was the sinner. Would that you had been.' "'But tis the other, tis the other, by God. "'I must e'en up and after them. "'Whom do you suspect?' "'Sir John would not give a name, "'and stultified rather than agitated, "'Lord Upland Towers accompanied him back to Cheen. "'He again asked upon whom were the baronet's suspicions directed, "'and the impulsive Sir John was no match "'for the insistence of Upland Towers. "'He said at length, "'I fear tis Edmund Willows. "'Who's he?' A young fellow of Shotsford Farm, a widow woman's son, the other told him, and explained that the Willow's father or grandfather was the last of the old glass painters in that village, where, as you may know, the art lingered on when it had died out in every other part of England. By God, that's bad, mighty bad, said Lord Upland Towers, throwing himself back in the chaise in frigid despair. They dispatched emissaries in all directions one by the Melchester Road, another by Shotsford Forum, another coastwards. But the lovers had a ten-hour start, 
and it was apparent that sound judgment had been exercised in choosing as their time of flight the particular night when the movements of a strange carriage would not be noticed, either in the park or on the neighbouring highway, owing to the general press of vehicles. The chaise which had been seen waiting at Lorton Inn was, no doubt, the one they had escaped in, and the pair of heads which had planned so cleverly thus far had probably contrived marriage ere now. The fears of her parents were realized. A letter sent by special messenger from Barbara on the evening of that day briefly informed them that her lover and herself were on the way to London, and before this communication reached her home they would be united as husband and wife. She had taken this extreme step because she loved her dear Edmund as she could love no other man, and because she had seen closing round her the doom of marriage with Lord Upland Towers, unless she put that threatened fate out of possibility by doing as she had done. She had well considered the step beforehand, and was prepared to live like any other country townsman's wife if her father repudiated her for her action. "'Damn her!' said Lord Upland Towers, as he drove homeward that night. "'Damn her for a fool!' which shows the kind of love he bore her. Well, Sir John had already started in pursuit of them as a matter of duty, driving like a wild man to Melchester, and thence by the direct highway to the capital. But he soon saw that he was acting to no purpose, and by and by, discovering that the marriage had actually taken place, he forbore all attempts to unearth them in the city, and returned and sat down with his lady to digest the event as best they could. To proceed against this Willows for the abduction of our heiress was possibly in their power, yet when they considered the now unalterable facts they refrained from violent retribution. Some six weeks passed, during which time Barbara's parents, though they keenly felt her loss, held no communication with the truant, either for reproach or condemnation. They continued to think of the disgrace she had brought upon herself, for though the young man was an honest fellow and the son of an honest father, the latter had died so early, and his widow had had such struggles to maintain herself, that the son was very imperfectly educated. Moreover, his blood was, as far as they knew, of no distinction whatever whilst hers, through her mother, was compounded of the best juices of ancient baronial distillation, containing tinctures of Monville and Mohoon, and Seward and Peverell, and Culliford and Talbot, and Plantagenet and York, and Lancaster, and God knows what besides, to which it was a thousand pities to throw away. The father and mother sat by the fireplace that was spanned by the four-centred arch bearing the family shields on its haunches, and groaned aloud, the lady more than Sir John. "'To think this should have come upon us in our old age,' said he. "'Speak for yourself,' she snapped through her sobs. "'I am only one and forty. Why didn't you ride faster and overtake him? In the meantime, the young married lovers, caring no more about their blood than about ditch-water, were intensely happy." happy, that is, in the descending scale which, as we all know, heaven in its wisdom has ordained for such rash cases. That is to say, the first week they were in the seventh heaven, the second in the sixth, the third week temperate, the fourth reflective, and so on. A lover's heart after possession being comparable to the earth in its geologic stages as described to us sometimes by our worthy president. First a hot coal, then a warm one, then a cooling cinder, then chilly. The simile shall be pursued no further. The long and the short of it was that one day a letter, sealed with their daughter's own little seal, came into Sir John and Lady Grebe's hands, and on opening it they found it to contain an appeal from the young couple to Sir John to forgive them for what they had done, and they would fall on their naked knees and be the most dutiful children for evermore. Then Sir John and his lady sat down again by the fireplace with the four-centred arch, and consulted and re-read the letter. Sir John Grebe, if truth must be told, loved his daughter's happiness far more, poor man, than he loved his name and lineage. He recalled to his mind all her little ways, gave vent to a sigh, and by this time acclimatized to the idea of the marriage, said that what was done could not be undone, and that he supposed they must not be too harsh with her. Perhaps Barbara and her husband were in actual need, and how could they let their only child starve? 
A slight consolation had come to them in an unexpected manner. They had been credibly informed that an ancestor of plebeian willows was once honoured with intermarriage with a scion of the aristocracy who had gone to the dogs. In short, such is the foolishness of distinguished parents, and sometimes of the others also, that they wrote that very day to the address Barbara had given them, informing her that she might return home and bring her husband with her. They would not object to seeing him, would not reproach her, and would endeavour to welcome them both, and to discuss with them what could best be arranged for their future. In three or four days a rather shabby post-chaise drew up at the door of Cheen Manor House, at sound of which the tender-hearted baronet and his wife ran out, as if to welcome a prince and princess of the blood. They were overjoyed to see their spoilt child return safe and sound, though she was only Mrs. Willows, wife of Edmund Willows of nowhere. Barbara burst into penitential tears, and both husband and wife were contrite enough, as well they might be, considering that they had not a guinea to call their own. When the four had calmed themselves, and not a word of chiding had been uttered to the pair, they discussed the position soberly, young Willows sitting in the background with great modesty, till invited forward by Lady Grebe in no frigid tone. "'How handsome he is,' she said to herself. "'I don't wonder at Barbara's craze for him.' He was, indeed, one of the handsomest men who had ever set his lips on a maid's. A blue coat, murray waistcoat, and breeches of drab set off a figure that could scarcely be surpassed. He had large, dark eyes, anxious now, as they glanced from Barbara to her parents and tenderly back again to her, observing whom, even now in her trepidation, one could see why the sang-froid of Lord Upland Towers had been raised to more than lukewarmness. Her fair young face, according to the tale handed down by old women, looked out from under a grey conical hat, trimmed with white ostrich feathers, and her little toes peeped from a buff petticoat worn under a puce gown. Her features were not regular, they were almost infantine, as you may see from the miniatures in possession of the family, her mouth showing much sensitiveness, and one could be sure that her faults would not lie on the side of bad temper, unless for urgent reasons. Well, they discussed their state as became them, and the desire of the young couple to gain the good will of those upon whom they were literally dependent for everything induced them to agree to any temporizing measure that was not too irksome. Therefore, having been nearly two months united, they did not oppose Sir John's proposal that he should furnish Edmund Willows with funds sufficient for him to travel a year on the continent in the company of a tutor, the young man undertaking to lend himself with the utmost diligence to the tutor's instructions, till he had become polished outwardly and inwardly to the degree required in the husband of such a lady as Barbara. He was to apply himself to the study of languages, manners, history, society, ruins, and everything else that came under his eyes, till he should return to take his place without blushing by Barbara's side. And by that time, said worthy Sir John, I'll get my little place out at Usehold ready for you and Barbara to occupy on your return. The house is small and out of the way, but it will do for a young couple for a while. If twere no bigger than a summer house, it would do, says Barbara. If twere no bigger than a sedan chair, said Willows, and the more lonely the better. We can put up with loneliness, said Barbara, with less zest. Some friends will come, no doubt. All this being laid down, a travelled tutor was called in, a man of many gifts and great experience, and on a fine morning away the tutor and pupil went. A great reason urged against Barbara accompanying her youthful husband was that his attentions to her would naturally be such as to prevent his zealously applying every hour of his time to learning and seeing, an argument of wise prescience, and unanswerable. Regular days for letter-writing were fixed, Barbara and her Edmund exchanged their last kisses at the door, and the chaise swept under the archway into the drive. He wrote to her from Le Havre as soon as he reached that port, which was not for seven days on account of adverse winds. He wrote from Rouen and from Paris, described to her his sight of the king and court at Versailles, and the wonderful marble work and mirrors in that palace, wrote next from Lyon, then, after a comparatively long interval, from Turin, narrating his fearful adventures in crossing Mount Sanus on mules, and how he was overtaken with a terrific snowstorm, which had well nigh been the end of him and his tutor and his guides. Then he wrote glowingly of Italy, and Barbara could see the development of her husband's mind reflected in his letters month by month, 
and she much admired the forethought of her father in suggesting this education for Edmund. Yet she sighed sometimes, her husband being no longer in evidence to fortify her in her choice of him, and timidly dreaded what mortifications might be in store for her by reason of this mésalliance. She went out very little, for on the one or two occasions on which she had shown herself to former friends, she noticed a distinct difference in their manner, as though they should say, "'Ah, my happy swain's wife, you're caught!' Edmund's letters were as affectionate as ever, even more affectionate after a while than hers were to him. Barbara observed this growing coolness in herself, and like a good and honest lady was horrified and grieved, since her only wish was to act faithfully and uprightly. It troubled her so much that she prayed for a warmer heart, and at last wrote to her husband to beg him, now that he was in the land of art, to send her his portrait, ever so small, that she might look at it all day and every day, and never for a moment forget his features. Willows was nothing loath, and replied that he would do more than she wished. He had made friends with a sculptor in Pisa, who was much interested in him and his history, and he had commissioned the artist to make a bust of him in marble, which when finished he would send her. What Barbara had wanted was something immediate, but she expressed no objection to the delay, and in his next communication Edmund told her that the sculptor, of his own choice, had decided to increase the bust to a full-length statue, so anxious was he to get a specimen of his skill introduced to the notice of the English aristocracy. It was progressing well and rapidly. Meanwhile, Barbara's attention began to be occupied at home with Eusholt Lodge, the house that her kind-hearted father was preparing for her residence when her husband returned. It was a small place on the plan of a large one, a cottage built in the form of a mansion, having a central hall with a wooden gallery running round it, and rooms no bigger than closets to follow this introduction. It stood on a slope so solitary and surrounded by trees so dense that the birds who inhabited the boughs sang at strange hours as if they hardly could distinguish night from day. During the progress of repairs at this bower, Barbara frequently visited it. Though so secluded by the dense growth, it was near the high road, and one day, while looking over the fence, she saw Lord Upland Towers riding past. He saluted her courteously, yet with mechanical stiffness, and did not halt. Barbara went home and continued to pray that she might never cease to love her husband. After that, she sickened and did not come out of doors for a long time. The year of education had extended to fourteen months, and the house was in order for Edmund's return to take up his abode there with Barbara, when instead of the accustomed letter for her, came one to Sir John Grebe in the handwriting of the said tutor, informing him of a terrible catastrophe that had occurred to them in Venice. Mr. Willows and himself had attended the theatre one night during the carnival of the preceding week, to witness the Italian comedy, when, owing to the carelessness of one of the candle-snuffers, the theatre had caught fire and been burned to the ground. Few persons had lost their lives, owing to the superhuman exertions of some of the audience in getting out the senseless sufferers, and among them all, he who had risked his own life the most heroically was Mr. Willows. In re-entering for the fifth time to save his fellow creatures, some fiery beams had fallen upon him, and he had been given up for lost. He was, however, by the blessing of Providence, recovered, with the life still in him, though he was fearfully burnt, and by almost a miracle he had seemed likely to survive, his constitution being wondrously sound. He was, of course, unable to write, but he was receiving the attention of several skilful surgeons. Further report would be made by the next mail or by private hand. The tutor said nothing in detail of poor Willow's sufferings, but as soon as the news was broken to Barbara, she realized how intense they must have been, and her immediate instinct was to rush to his side, though on consideration the journey seemed impossible to her. Her health was by no means what it had been, and to post across Europe at this season of the year, or to traverse the Bay of Biscay in a sailing craft, was an undertaking that would hardly be justified by the result. But she was very anxious to go, till on reading the end of the letter, her husband's tutor was found to hint very strongly against such a step if it should be contemplated, this being also the opinion of the surgeons. 
and though Willow's comrade refrained from giving his reasons, they disclosed themselves plainly enough in the sequel. The truth was that the worst of the wounds resulting from the fire had occurred to his head and face, that handsome face which had won her heart from her, and both the tutor and the surgeons knew that for a sensitive young woman to see him before his wounds had healed would cause more misery to her by the shock than happiness to him by her ministrations. Lady Gree blurted out what Sir John and Barbara had thought, but had had too much delicacy to express. Sure, it is mighty hard for you, poor Barbara, that the one little gift he had to justify your rash choice of him, his wonderful good looks, should be taken away like this, to leave thee no excuse at all for your conduct in the world's eyes. Well, well, I wish you'd married t'other, that do I. And the lady sighed. "'He'll soon get right again,' said her father soothingly. Such remarks as the above were not often made, but they were frequent enough to cause Barbara an uneasy sense of self-stultification. She determined to hear them no longer, and the house at Useholds being ready and furnished, she withdrew thither with her maids, where for the first time she could feel mistress of a home that would be hers and her husband's exclusively when he came. After long weeks, Willows had recovered sufficiently to be able to write himself, and slowly and tenderly he enlightened her upon the full extent of his injuries. It was a mercy, he said, that he had not lost his sight entirely, but he was thankful to say he still retained full vision in one eye, though the other was dark forever. The sparing manner in which he meted out particulars of his condition told Barbara how appalling had been his experience. He was grateful for her assurance that nothing could change her, but feared she did not fully realize that he was so sadly disfigured as to make it doubtful if she would recognize him. However, in spite of all, his heart was as true to her as it had ever been. Barbara saw from his anxiety how much lay behind. She replied that she submitted to the decrees of fate and would welcome him in any shape as soon as he could come. She told him of the pretty retreat in which she had taken up her abode, pending their joint occupation of it, and did not reveal how much she had sighed over the information that all his good looks were gone. Still less did she say that she felt a certain strangeness in awaiting him, the weeks they had lived together having been so short by comparison with the length of his absence. Slowly drew on the time when Willows found himself well enough to come home. He landed at Southampton, and posted thence to Usholt. Barbara arranged to go out to meet him as far as the Lorton Inn, the spot between the forest and the chase at which he had waited for night on the evening of their elopement. Thither she drove at the appointed hour in a little pony chaise, presented to her by her father on her birthday for her especial use in her new house, which vehicle she sent back on arriving at the inn, the plan agreed upon being that she should perform the return journey with her husband in his hired coach. There was not much accommodation for a lady at this wayside tavern, but as it was a fine evening in early summer she did not mind, walking about outside and straining her eyes along the highway for the expected one. But each cloud of dust that enlarged in the distance and drew near was found to disclose a conveyance other than his post-chaise. Barbara remained till the appointment was two hours past, and then began to fear that owing to some adverse wind in the channel he was not coming that night. While she was waiting, she was conscious of a curious trepidation that was not entirely solicitude, and did not amount to dread. Her tense state of incertitude bordered both on disappointment and on relief. She had not lived six or seven weeks with an imperfectly educated yet handsome husband, whom now she had not seen for seventeen months, and who was so changed physically by an accident that she was assured she would hardly know him. Can we wonder at her compound state of mind? But her immediate difficulty was to get away from the Lornton Inn, for her situation was becoming embarrassing. Like too many of Barbara's actions, this drive had been undertaken without much reflection. Expecting to wait no more than a few minutes for her husband in his post-chaise, and to enter it with him, she had not hesitated to isolate herself by sending back her own little vehicle. She now found that, being so well known in this neighborhood, her excursion to meet her long-absent husband was exciting great interest. She was conscious that more eyes were watching her from the inn windows than met her own gaze. Barbara had decided to get home by hiring whatever kind of conveyance the tavern afforded, 
when straining her eyes for the last time over the now darkening highway, she perceived yet another dust cloud drawing near. She paused. A chariot ascended to the inn and would have passed had not its occupant caught sight of her standing expectantly. The horses were checked on the instant. "'You are here? And alone, my dear Mrs. Willows?' said Lord Upland Towers, whose carriage it was. She explained what had brought her to this lonely situation, and as he was going in the direction of her own home, she accepted his offer of a seat beside him. Their conversation was embarrassed and fragmentary at first, but when they had driven a mile or two, she was surprised to find herself talking earnestly and warmly to him. Her impulsiveness was in truth but the natural consequence of her late existence, a somewhat desolate one by reason of the strange marriage she had made, and there is no more indiscreet mood than that of a woman surprised into talk, who has long been imposing upon herself a policy of reserve. Therefore her ingenuous heart rose with a bound into her own throat, when in response to his leading questions, or rather hints, she allowed her troubles to leak out of her. Lord Upland Towers took her quite to her own door, although he had driven three miles out of his way to do so, and in handing her down she heard from him a whisper of stern reproach. It need not have been thus if you had listened to me. She made no reply and went indoors. There, as the evening wore away, she regretted more and more that she had been so friendly with Lord Upland Towers. But he had launched himself upon her so unexpectedly. If only she had foreseen the meeting with him, what a careful line of conduct she would have marked out. Barbara broke into a perspiration of disquiet when she thought of her unreserve, and in self-chastisement resolved to sit up till midnight on the bare chance of Edmund's return, directing that supper should be laid for him, improbable as his arrival till the morrow was. End of chapter 2, part 1